Hey, I'd like to welcome everybody. Today's topic is rehabilitation in small animal practice, a therapeutic exercise. Our presenter today is Dr. Deirdre Caramonte, who received her DVM from Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine, and she is a diplomat of ACVIM. Uh, she is further, uh, was further a staff internist and the director of the Tina Senti Flaherty Rehabilitation and Fitness Unit at Animal Medical Center in New York City. Currently, she is the president of the Veterinary Medical Association of New York City, and she is the director of clinical education at ACC Animal Health. We welcome you, Deirdre. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, midday. Um, I'm sure I'm going to have a catastrophe because now one cat is very interested in what I'm doing, but I will count it as therapeutic exercise. Um, so we're going to talk about therapeutic exercise today. And uh, as I mentioned in the webinar we did, I think I did two weeks ago, uh, we talked about the modalities that we use in rehab. And although owners love all the bells and whistles, and we do too, for pain uh, management and control of inflammation, um, that's not exactly what puts muscle mass back onto these patients. So it's very important to have good pain control on board, uh, and then we can move on to actually doing the work. Okay. All right, so we're going to talk today about uh, why we do uh, therapeutic exercise, recognize the benefits of therapeutic exercise, and some examples of therapeutic exercises. And um, one of the things is there are so many variations on exercises. I couldn't capture all of them today, but it's sort of a baseline to uh, jump up from. So why do we do therapeutic exercise? Why can't we just put a laser on them, use the loop on them? Um, underwater treadmill is an exercise, but uh, so I went back to review some of the literature and uh, take this paper published in AJVR, The Effects of Early Intensive Postoperative Physiotherapy on Limb Function After a TPLO. Um, and they took eight dogs with TPLOs. Half of them received rehab three times a week, and the other half were just discharged with uh, walking with their owners. Uh, physiotherapy consisted of ice within two hours of surgery. Then they did passive range of motion, 30 repetitions. At discharge, owners received exercises and therapies, um, and that what they were to massage, do passive range of motion, functional weight bearing, ice packs, and controlled walking. And then dogs returned for formal rehab three times a week for six weeks. At suture removal, they introduced an underwater treadmill. So obviously before surgery, um, the cranial cruciate deficient limbs had significantly reduced thigh circumference, and a reduced flexion and extension range of motions compared with values for the contralateral control limb. Six weeks after the TPLO, the physiotherapy group had significantly larger thigh circumference than the home exercise group, with the difference almost no longer evident between the affected, so the surgical limb versus the non-affected limb. Extension and flexion range of motions were significantly greater in the rehab group compared with the values for the home exercise group. Um, so both groups had improvements for lameness and weight bearing scores over time, long term, and this is obviously a conversation for another time, uh, long term, both groups of dogs did very well. The second study published in JABMA used 51 client owned dogs with ruptured cruciate ligament that had a lateral retinacular stabilization, uh, 25 dogs had post-operative rehabilitation beginning at suture removal with massage, passive range of motion, walking, and swimming. 26 dogs were exercise restricted and just took only two short leash walks per day. Uh, prior to surgery, mean peak vertical force and vertical impulse in the affected limbs were similar between the groups. Six months after surgery, these peak vertical forces and vertical impulses were significantly increased in dogs of both groups. However, obviously the dogs in the rehab group were significantly greater than those in the exercise restricted group. Um, I think we know in veterinary medicine and veterinary rehabilitation that um, the majority of surgeons uh, 
would, you know, sometimes bandage the cruciate ligaments, definitely only leash walking. And it was a, just a pioneers of uh, rehab vets that said, no, 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 we cannot, cannot uh, bind these dogs up because we are going to have so much muscle atrophy, disuse atrophy, that uh, it's going to be really hard to get that back. All right, this is another study on uh, AJVR uh, that took surgically treated cruciate ligament deficient stifles and used E-STEM on the muscles. 12 dogs um, uh, were used and three weeks after the cruciate was injured, they had their stifles surgically stabilized. Three weeks, half the dogs started on an E-STEM protocol for thigh muscles. They were repeatedly evaluated for stifle function and 19 weeks, they looked at gross and histological evaluations. And the treated dogs had significantly better lameness scores and control dogs, less palpable crepitation, fewer radiographic signs of bone change, and less gross cartilage damage with improved thigh circumference. So then I like this study, oh, not study, it's a case report of a dog uh, published in Jaha where a three-year-old uh, Staffordshire Terrier was spayed and unfortunately within seven weeks was walking with the bilateral plantigrade stance in the pelvic limbs. Uh, she unfortunately had bilateral atrophy of the distal pelvic limb muscles, uh, enlarged lymph nodes, ulcerative wounds on the dorsal aspect of her rear paws. So they checked to make sure that all of her tendons and ligaments were intact, but a neurological exam localized a lesion to the distal sciatic nerve. So a diagnosis of compressive and stretch neuropathy was made affecting the distal sciatic nerve branch. So this dog went under um, pretty extensive rehab, uh, neuromuscular stim, ultrasound, and therapy. Uh, this dog also had orthotics and treated the wound care. And finally, um, after months, the dog had increased muscle mass, return of her segmental reflexes, return of her conscious proprioception, and the ability to walk on the pelvic limbs with the higher carriage uh, of her cock, cocks following presentation. So this is a nice study on the benefits of uh, swimming. Um, could improve the function of osteoarthritic joints. So they took 55 dogs and put them into three groups. So it was the population of dogs with osteoarthritis and they were in the swimming group. Then healthy dogs went into the swimming group and then healthy dogs were not in a swimming group. And all the animals that were receiving the swim program swam for a total of eight weeks. And clinical evaluation of the OA swimming group found that almost every parameter showed improvement. So these dogs were um, swimming at least two days for eight weeks continually and shown that it can improve the function of osteoarthritis. Also in the study, they used biomarkers, uh, which again, a whole other conversation, but those were uh, mostly improved in uh, the swimming dogs. This is a study of 12 hound dogs. They were used in a couple of different studies, but they had a unilateral uh, cranial cruciate ligament transection and the stifle was immediately stabilized. So in one of the other studies I mentioned, they waited a few weeks before they stabilized, but this was a transection and immediate stabilization. And these dogs were followed for thigh growth measurement, uh, DEXA, which is dual X-ray, dual energy X-ray absorptometry, um, and individualized measurements of the hind limb muscular, and this went on for weeks. So the conclusion was that the hind limb muscle mass decreased even though the stifle was immediately stabilized uh, as soon as it was injured. And the other thing that following all these different parameters was that the quadriceps, biceps femoris, and semimembranosis were most affected. And as therapists, we need to uh, target those muscles uh, following a post-cruciate injury. So let's move on to tissue types and what happens with injury. So when there's an injury to bone, uh, there's a decreased bone mineral content and density within three weeks. This leads to a decreased cross-sectional area and a decreased stress to failure for cancellous bone. Osteoblast numbers go down, so they're not making as much bone, and there's less longitudinal growth and healing. Um, after immobilization, efforts actually increase bone mineral content and density will require 
a greater than normal level of activity and for long periods up to um, upwards of 11 to 16 weeks. The effect of injury on joints is that there's articular cartilage generation and resorption with increased collagen crosslinks and stiffness within the periarticular soft tissues, and this leads to synovial membrane atrophy. Within the joint, uh, there's a fibro fatty proliferation, there are adhesions and obliteration sometimes of the joint cavity. And this all will lead to joint contracture, sometimes irreparable damage to the hyaline cartilage with eventual ankylosis. Uh, mobilization encourages cartilage preservation, extensibility of periarticular tissues, synovial structure, function, and joint nutrition. So even just doing slight joint mobilizations really can help the patient going a long way. With ligament injury, there's a decreased maximum load to failure, just like in the bones increased collagen fiber cross-linking and random fiber orientation. And we know that um, they, nice, they should be nice, straight, fibrous lines because when there's haphazard orientation, it makes it weaker with decreased structural integrity, especially at the insertion sites. So it's also important to note that the insertion sites remain weaker for a longer duration than the ligament proper. So even minimal stresses, mobilizations, et cetera, can help maintain 80 to 90% of the baseline mechanical properties. Sometimes, unfortunately, mechanical deficits aren't completely reversed even after 12 months of rehab. So those owners that come in with a dog who's pretty atrophied everywhere, they want the quick fix. And it's usually, um, I like to say, two or three times the length of time that the dog has been immobile, atrophied, et cetera. That's how long at least it's going to take to get it back with hard work. When muscle becomes injury, injured, there's a decreased cross-sectional area and muscle atrophy. Uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is altered. There's a decreased calcium uptake in slow twitch fibers, and these are the types that are better for um, endurance. There's decreased neuromuscular control, decreased force production and peak force uh, with a shortened twitch duration. Uh, immobilization effects are greater within slow twitch fibers. Non-weight bearing, uh, so that's the three-legged dog, uh, induces greater atrophy than does a mobilization with weight bearing. So even if we can get that dog to stand on that third unused leg, just with weight bearing, it's going to help us a lot. And then recovery of contractile properties can take several months, just like with all the other tissues we've learned. Um, there's no fast way to get everything back. So the force of gravity is the largest force on the body. Uh, muscles are used to fight gravity, obviously pushing bodies up off the ground. Muscles also lengthen and shorten constantly, but when an added force such as gravity, weight bearing, or resistance is added, more energy is needed to perform the movement. And in determining the best regimen, it's important to understand which muscles are injured. So we'll talk about some contractions here. Isometric contraction. <clears throat> the muscle fires or activates with force and tension, but there's no movement in a joint. In other words, the joint stays static. There's no lengthening or shortening of the muscle fibers, and the limbs don't move, but the muscle fibers still fire. And examples of isometric contractions are standing, weight-bearing, rhythmic stabilizations, sitting on a hill, snoopies, which we'll cover, and the use of a rocker board. So this is usually the first exercise that's done uh, when we're recovering some of these patients. Isotonic contractions maintain constant tension in the muscles as the muscle length changes. This can only occur when a muscle's maximum force of contraction exceeds the total load on the muscle, i.e. so you're going to build muscle. And these isotonic muscle contractions can either be concentric or eccentric. A concentric contraction is a type of contraction in which the muscles shorten while generating force. Such contractions also alter the angle of the joints to which the muscles are attached as they are stimulated to contract according to the sliding filament mechanism. This occurs throughout the length of the muscle, generating force at the musculotendinous junction, causing the muscle to shorten and the angle of the joint to change. So for instance, a concentric contraction of the biceps would cause the arm to bend at the elbow as a hand moves from the near um, to close to the shoulder, i.e. a biceps curl. 
um, a concentric contraction of the triceps would be the opposite direction, straightening the arm. Some canine examples are tugging or backing up the hill if you want to target the supraspinatus. And eccentric contraction results in the elongation of a muscle. Such contractions decelerate the muscle joints. They act as breaks to the opposing concentric contractions. Um, during this time, the muscle will elongate while under tension due to the opposing force. And rather than working to pull a joint in the direction of the muscle, the muscle acts to decelerate the joint at the end of a movement. So strength training uh, is best achieved involving both eccentric and concentric contractions. This, they appear to increase muscular strength much better than just one type of um, muscle contraction, which makes sense. Uh, so why is any of this important? Well, uh, it's really important um, that we know what we're trying to target because a lot of these dogs, especially um, in my history, we had either the um, athletic dog, the police dog that comes in with an acute injury and there's really good muscle tone, or the 14 year old dog that gets wheeled in in a cart and uh, we need to make that pet better. Uh, one thing we do know and research has been established in human and um, veterinary world is um, the patient should be well warmed up prior to conditioning work um, as well as sufficiently cooled down. Uh, fatigue can be an indication that the exercise, that specific one, uh, and we would look for muscles trembling and fasciculating or the whole workout is too hard. So besides muscle fasciculations, uh, patients stepping off the equipment, um, them not keeping proper form, uh, doing the exercises extra slowly, or for some dogs, um, doing them extra quickly, excessive panting, um, and other ways that the dogs will wanna change the subject. And if the dog is fatigued by one of the exercises, the next time they do the workout, they should do fewer reps and do that for a full week, then start to increase the reps again to tolerance. So um, everybody thinks that rehab, again, is all the modalities, and certainly there are some expensive modalities. Um, I do love all the modalities, no matter what their price range is. Um, but for therapeutic exercises, we really don't have to spend a lot of money. Uh, so take, for example, the physio roll. Uh, which is a thick rubberized plastic, so hopefully their uh, non-toenail trim these days, uh, nails can't puncture. Uh, there are round ones, peanut-shaped ones, and they help improve balance, coordination, and strength. Uh, and these are very useful when the animal is unable to support their own weight. Uh, these were recently priced, I think when I put this lecture together, the yellow uh, peanut was like $110, and I think today on uh, Amazon, it was $65. So all these are also coming down in price depending on uh, where you get them from, uh, et cetera. All right, so here's an example of using the physio roll. And this is uh, Austin. And one of the, I like to lead off with this um, video because it shows a couple of things. Uh, one, you have to have a lot of patience when you do rehab with patients, especially when doing therapeutic animals, because you want to make it a very uh, positive environment. Um, and two, um, you always have to have a sense of humor. We uh, had lots of fun working in the unit where I worked, um, which helps everybody's morale. So we'll just watch Austin here. kind of like watching the grass grow. Um, I'll talk about treats since we see here, I think Brittany is actually um, giving this dog lots of treats. So um, Austin is really um, a trim dog, which is great. Um, what we would do in the overweight obese dogs, if they're food motivated, we would have the owners hold off on feeding the patient in the morning. We also like them to bring in their own treats so we don't uh, cause any GI distress. Um, 
and uh, at some point we'll actually make Austin get on this. But anyway, uh, just sort of a There we go. See? Were you on mute for a bit or um we might you might have cut out for a second. No. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. All right. So we'll move on. So we that Austin took forever. This is Dakota and this is a police dog and whoop right up there in 2 seconds. So also good uh rehab is also uh, a little labor intensive. Uh, so we need definitely all hands on deck when we're dealing with some of these patients. Um, hi, Renee, if you're watching. All right, moving on. BOSU, these are um, also fairly inexpensive these days. The BOSU helps to increase strength, coordination, balance, and is really especially good for our neuro dogs. The nubs um, on the BOSU can help with conscious proprioceptive feedback to the brain to enhance neurological recovery. And I guess this is cheating. This isn't a real BOSU because they have complete flat bottoms with an arch top, but uh, we get the point here. A lot about rehab is sort of improvising uh, with what you have. Here's another. Um, these are inexpensive, tiny little proprioceptive discs. And um, this dog is just sort of learning. This is work for this dog. It's also feedback um, for the brain. And they're finding just it's so fascinating when you dive into sort of new pain research, how um, even orthopedic pain will eventually become neurological pain and trigger um, those um, <clears throat> feedback mechanisms. So this is Barley. And again, motivation is always good. You can see he's got one little chicken leg who is shaved in the back and his motivation is that's his carrier. So he is desperate to get into that carrier. So we would take advantage and use whatever we could to get that dog moving. Now, um, someone would say maybe that's not entirely the best um, uh, presentation for all those muscles, but you know, Barley, it's not even thinking that he's exercising at that point. Then we have this type of dog, and you can tell by the kyphotic shaved back. This is a chronic uh, T3L3 type presentation, and um, just trying to balance on that is. Uh, you know, is non-concussive, which is great, and also helping to stimulate uh, feedback by using the nubs on the ball, and um, also fun. Now, my favorite use of actually using the uh, BOSU is just for a little reward after your workout. You just get to scratch your itchy, um, Frenchy face. So what else can we do if we don't have even that? Well, we can do uneven surface walking. And um, akin to uh, what we'll talk about Cavaletti's in a second, but just having the animal think about what they're crawling up and over and using different textiles um, really gets them to sort of encourage range of motion. And then you can put those all together. And this is obviously, you know, a hemi lamb dog and just going over Certain different obstacles helps to get them to think and be motivated. That right there is an old Reebok stepper. I'm sure all of us who are over the age of 40 have one under their bed that they're not using. Um, and this is Chompy, I think, and we'll see quite a bit. He was a <clears throat> frequent flyer at our rehab unit. Again, I think everybody has an air mattress. Um, and so uneven, uneven surface balances um, are great exercises. Uh, I think this is Rolo and he had um, left elbow arthroscopy and just getting him to do this type of work um, is important. He doesn't really think he's exercising, but this is targeting all the different muscles in his body in a non-concussive manner. And then we can actually change it to having them walk across it, which is even more um, conscious proprioceptive feedback to the dogs. And um, we thought that using one of these mattresses, they would pop pretty quickly, but um, we kept that for quite a while. All right, so let's talk about Cavaletti rails. They increase proprioceptive feedback and increase flexion and extension. Look at her left hock. Uh, she wouldn't normally carry her hock that high, but wow, 
um, that really encourages her to use um, flexion and extension. Uh, these can be made very inexpensively with ladders, broomsticks, PVC pipes, and cones from Home Depot. Uh, what's nice about actual Cavaletti rails, as opposed to using something like a ladder that is a uh, fixed distance and fixed height, is you can alter. You see some of those are angled there, higher end on the left, stuck into a hole that was drilled into a cone, and it just makes them think. And the other way um, that we can use them, all right, here's a movie. I forget who this is. So again, these cones are adjustable. You can have them short, um, tall, et cetera. Um, that's one good exercise. I think that might be Austin again. And then you take the slow and steady. This is a dog who would typically present in a cart and just getting her to walk back over those um, several times is really big exercise for her. Um, one of my friends, Ross Palmer at CSU, talks about sort of the old fat arthritic dog as uh, you can't really get ointment to go back into the tube once you've squeezed it out. Um, but I think with rehab, that's actually the best shot that we have to actually getting close to doing something like that. And another use, if you have cones, is to actually use them as a figure eight. This will help with definitely um, <clears throat> flexion and extension of the shoulder joints, um, abaxial, axial sort of movement um, going around. And he's quite a knucklehead, doesn't really even know that he's exercising. I love working with labs and rehab. They're very fun because um, they're very food motivated. So let's talk about some simple things we can do uh, with no equipment at all would be paw shakes. It actually helps with core strengthening because they have to rock back on the hind limbs. They're using um, their other limb to support and we're increasing elbow flexion. Here's a very cute paw shake. Um, this was alpha and uh, always important to do. Yeah, he was, he was a lefty. But just a very simple exercise we can do. I know um, I see by one of my attendees, um, she's a Bernese mountain dog lover, so um, she should start doing these with her dog. Another uh, good exercise for um, elbow and flexion and extension would be to use tunnels to sort of have them creep through. Uh, we use this uh, method a couple times, but we also, uh, can raise the Cavaletti rails. You not move on? Okay, and uh, that is uh, definitely uh, a good exercise for this dog who can definitely handle it. They don't usually go through that quickly, and most of them prefer to hop over the rails, but uh, very good exercise as well. All right, how about a scrunchie to the nose? Uh, this is also good for front limb flexion and extension. Just put the scrunchie on the nose and have them uh, peel it off. Um, so very inexpensive exercise there. Through helping uh, conscious proprioceptive feedback to any limb, uh, we could put any type of um, weight or obstacle. Um, so this is a bear bell, which helps not only with uh, the sound of the annoying bell, um, but just the feeling of something on the leg. So what we're trying to accomplish is that that dog is going to want to shake that bell off. And so it will put most of its weight on the other hind limb and try to increase um, uh, exercise on the right. But by doing that, you're also putting more weight bearing on the left. And for the left, it's not a concussive force, which is great. So here's a dog who's actually wearing a couple. And you can tell just by uh, the dog's movements. Um, if we can get her to walk. Go for it. So definitely um, increasing range of motion of those joints. Now, the nice thing about using something, you can use a plastic bag, um, and we'll get to one where there's a syringe cap on the 
taped to the bottom of the paw is you can put it on the affected leg. So like this dog is trying to shake that off, but this dog's affected, affected leg is the left. So it's putting more weight bearing on the left hind leg. Um, you can also put the, uh, if we switch limbs, then it would be um, doing a different type of exercise to strengthen that left hind limb. And we can put these all together, walk through. I think this dog's name was Allie. Very happy. Most of the dogs coming into rehab, they're so whoop, hoppity hop, but um, getting some pelvic motion in there. Uh, but just combining so everybody, uh, dogs, techs, don't get bored doing the exercise and just a slight variation on each exercise. So, all right, so here's a syringe cap. Um, that's uh, vet wrapped to the bottom and you can tell that just wearing this it's annoying um, him so he's actually doing a little bit more uh, lifting of that limb putting more weight on the other limb uh, etc so there are many inexpensive exercises we could do uh, the all famous cookie stretch um, so again a non-concussive exercise helps with definite um, uh, flexion and extension. And the nice thing about a cookie stretch, and that was only an example of left and right. So we would start with uh, cookie stretches just to see how far we could get them. So as a way of measuring range of motion. Uh, but you can do cookie stretches to the shoulder, cookie stretches to the hip, cookie stretches down to the floor. <clears throat> do that on the other side. You can also do cookie stretches up, cookie stretches down or the dog will attempt to put his head down through his legs. So cookie stretches are a really good way of one, checking uh, their flexion and extension and uh, guiding improvement, but also as a way to actually um, start uh, trying to lengthen the contractions on some of these muscles. This is a uh, world famous Finnegan. Uh, and he was our model for quite some time, even something as simple as this, three-legged standing. Um, Three-legged standing is an example of an isometric exercise. And so um, it doesn't look like he's working pretty hard, but in an old arthritic dog, if you pick up one leg, uh, some of them will just fall right over because they just don't have the strength. They don't have the core strength. Uh, so this is a very good exercise. Or we can do paraleg standing, otherwise called a Snoopy. Um, it's all very excellent for flexibility and strengthening the neck and the trunk. And with paraleg standing, because it's just two legs, you can choose to do opposing limbs, like uh, Finn is doing here, or same side limbs. And what you are trying to do though, uh, when you're supporting the weight of the dog is not really supporting the weight. You want them to sort of be balancing um, and using their core to balance instead of literally using you as their appendages. Um, Sidestepping, um, again, and you know, very inexpensive exercise. You just need a, a tech, a leash, and a dog, um, and an owner uh, if they want to do it. Targets the gluteal muscles, particularly um, important for stabilizing uh, the hip muscles. Uh, and when they actually do very well with sidestepping, you can increase the intensity by doing these up a hill or down a hill or using weights or stepping over objects uh, to increase how high the leg is lifted. All right, so um, doing some lower extremity work. This is uh, Rudy, a canine dog, showing us the backup. The backup is important uh, when we get to some um, advanced exercises and the dog doesn't think he's exercising, but he is actually doing some Good work there. All right, here's another example. And you can tell just the breed differences on how uh, um, differently. So trying to keep the dogs, depending on, again, what muscles you're targeting, um, dog head up, not as hunched in the hind legs um, with the police dog versus um, Austin. So, and this is an example. We're trying to work on the hind limbs, so just picking up um, the dog's front limbs and just having them stand on their hind limbs, dance. Uh, you can go backwards, you can go forwards. You can obviously do targeting the front limbs by holding them up in sort of a wheelbarrow position. 
Um, these are all really good therapeutic exercises. So another example, um, and uh, the dog is wearing a bear bell and I think a syringe cap just to increase sort of the feedback to the dog's brain um, to get them to actually use the hind limbs. Sit to stands, one of our favorites. Uh, I think this is also chompy. Now, one of the things that we wanna work on definitely besides doing a sit to stand or a stand to sit in this case is uh, control. So a lot of the big dogs, a lot of the arthritic dogs, a lot of the fat dogs will just flop down and their legs will splay out sideways. So having your um, tech, that owner, whoever is behind the dog, actually just encourage a very slow stand to sit, not a flopping over, not letting the legs flay, uh, splay out to the sides. So the number of repetitions isn't necessarily as important as the quality of the exercise that we're trying to perform. And we wanna retrain and rebuild the muscles correctly, not incorrectly. So um, even though this is a ridiculously cute dog doing this, um, we're trying to make sure that the dog is doing it correctly. Sometimes harder in a big dog, um, but uh, another very good exercise and work for the therapist as well. So, especially in a lot of these long-term cruciate uh, deficient dogs, atrophy dogs, is that they'll try to sit sort of right-sided or left-sided and really important just to keep the hips and the stifles and the hocks uh, square. So most of our police dogs always came in with their handler, um, but this dog has pretty good, obviously the dog's in shape, um, so, uh, and very flexible, but um, good exercise. And then you have what I'm talking about is, you know, it didn't seem like too much work for those other couple of dogs, but this dog clearly, um, you know, needs to work on A, losing weight, B, uh, having correct positioning, and the dog, um, you can tell has been doing work like this for a while because even though she looks very out of shape, um, her legs aren't splaying to the sides. So, so maybe that left one right there. Um, but really good exercise, and this can absolutely uh, tire out a dog, um, especially who's out of shape. Assistive devices, uh, we love. Uh, one of the things that we learned working in our rehab unit um, is that if they are in the correct posture, so um, having a T3L3 dog <clears throat> who's just sort of laying around the house and um, using the sling to get around, is sometimes um, this would be a better way to support them because if they're in their correct posture, when they're trying to do the exercises, again, it's retraining the muscles and building musculature uh, when they're in the correct form. So, um, Originally, when, I think when rehab was first starting, um, assistive devices were more thought of, you know, it can't walk anymore, let's put it in the cart so we can get around at least on its front end. And uh, assistive devices can be wonderful interim usage devices um, to retrain these dogs so they can graduate to not using the cart. Um, for big dogs, uh, this is an overhead lift system, and this is Sonny. Um, he had uh, fibrocartilaginous emboli, and he was a dog who um, stayed with us for very many days, was dropped off very many days in a row. <clears throat> and um, this size dog would put um, a rehab therapist, uh, probably uh, their back would go out. They'd be definitely sore after dealing with a dog like this. So having an overhead lift system or... Um, the assistive device in the previous movie showing that if the dogs are upright and sort of in their correct posture, it's much easier to work on what you actually need to work on. And uh, Sonny made uh, close to a darn near full recovery, uh, but it took a lot of effort. So, uh, but he lived in that sling for quite a while. And also to um, make sure is that when these sort of decrepit atrophied dogs um, stroke dogs um, are working hard and dragging their feet because they have proprioceptive issues uh, to look at their toes 
Um, a lot of dogs will have these little injuries and one some bandaging to um, using the loop or the laser to help them, um, you know, sort of heal those because you don't want those to, uh, the skin to break open. So what's important, so we can do all that work um, in the rehab unit. Uh, so typically we would, uh, the owner uh, would drop off the dog. Uh, so many of the dogs were so relaxed, they just go over right away and lay on the blue mat. They knew that they were gonna get some, um, they were gonna be assessed and then have a heating pad put on them, most likely to sort of uh, get everything uh, more limber. Uh, and then we do the exercises because we're able to control uh, with modalities their pain. Um, and then when they go home, then it's the owner's job. And so the owners have to do homework for the dogs because who would expect just working out um, a couple hours each week that we're going to actually build um, momentum. Uh, so we like to give the owner and the dog only three exercises. They should be simple. They should also be something that uh, the owner has watched um, the therapist do. Uh, and I always like to have the owner's video so they know exactly what they're trying to do, especially if you're going to graduate to a, a stand to sit or sit to stand position. Uh, they should do three exercises three times a day, and they should keep track of it in their uh, diary so we can monitor progress. So here is some homework. And I think this dog unfortunately had three different, or two or three different surgeries for T3L3, uh, which is unfortunate, but very dedicated owners and uh, who always did their homework, which is great. All right, so finally, um, they're flexible. They've been working, uh, they've been doing their, exercises, uh, they're not in pain, now you have to build endurance. Um, and in New York City, there weren't a ton of agility dogs, um, but in other parts of the country, these dogs, a lot of these dogs were working dogs, um, and so we really have to figure out how to build endurance. <clears throat> so as muscle endurance increases, the muscle will be able to perform a greater number of contractions or hold against the load over an extended period. Total body endurance, sometimes called aerobic exercise or conditioning, is performed to enhance cardiovascular fitness as well. There are immediate changes with endurance activities. There's increased blood flow to muscles, which we want, uh, increase in heart rate, uh, increased oxygen demand and consumption, and a quicker respiratory rate and depth of respiration. So these are ways that we can also monitor uh, if we're stressing them out too much during this endurance building. Uh, we don't want them to be uh, completely out of breath. But the nice thing after uh, doing endurance work is that there are some long-term adaptive changes that include better muscular body efficiency, a lower resting heart rate, uh, and the heart rate returns to normal more quickly. And these are um, significant uh, evaluation points of actually having a dog that um, is in better, has better endurance. So some precautions to exercise, recovery time needs to be built into every training program. Uh, they need to replenish energy stores, uh, lactic acid removed from skeletal muscle and blood after about an hour. Um, rest is a very equal part to the exercise. You can't just do one without the other and hope to accomplish long-term physical performance. Um, overwork can be avoided if the intensity, duration, and progression of exercises are increased slowly and monitored closely. And if we train, if owners train uh, their dogs too vigorously but don't have adequate food intake or fat stores to match the energy expenditure, um, the required energy may be found by breaking down of the body protein in the muscle. So we wanna make sure that these guys have adequate nutrition stores. <clears throat> Acute muscle soreness. Um, during or directly after strenuous exercise uh, with muscle fatigue is secondary to a lack of adequate blood flow, oxygen, and a temporary buildup of metabolites such as lactic acid and potassium. Massage will greatly help um, 
with this before, during, and afterwards. Uh, and in my last lecture, when we talked about modalities, about the importance of massage, also um, taking that uh, hip dysplastic, chunky dog who's sort of very slow in the hind, they are always using their fronts, their shoulders, or elbows uh, to do a majority of the work. So massaging uh, those areas um, for secondary sort of injury and trauma um, due to training is greatly um, effective. And consistency, just like with us, the only way to see changes in strength and endurance, which will promote goals of increased um, on the job performance as well as decrease the chance of injury. So to have healthy tissues, uh, pliable tissues, um, we're going to have less injuries. Uh, to see significant strength changes, you need to follow the program for at least six weeks, if not longer, endurance training. Um, and a lot of these dogs don't actually um, accomplish this for at least 10 or 12 weeks. So as they are um, exercising, uh, gradually increase the intensity and the duration of the exercise program. In the cool down period, you want to prevent the blood from pooling. So after they're done with all these exercises, and uh, I mentioned before that when the animals would come in, we'd start them with um, sort of heating up their tissues. And what we want to do is if they're sore in any way, shape, or form, or whatever joint we've been exercising, use ice to um, uh, uh, decrease pain. Uh, and uh, so cool down is just as effective as warm up. And depending on how strenuous your exercise is, uh, your cool down period will, be, will differ. All right, so we talked about a lot of the benefits of therapeutic exercises and why we do it and some examples. Um, there's one exercise, my slide went missing, I'm not sure, when we um, actually are trying to work on some hip um, and hind limb um, flexibility is, uh, and also sometimes if they injure their head and their jaws is using uh, peanut butter in different uh, parts of the body. Uh, if the dog is food motivated, just sort of spreading some peanut butter on the groin and having them um, sort of groom back there or even if they're um, an old arthritic dog or have neurological disease of uh, head, uh, muscle atrophy of the skull, um, having them eat. Uh, so peanut butter, getting them to use their jaws um, definitely can help as well. 